Okay, we're ready to get started? I'm ready. All right. Well, thanks everybody for showing up the day before spring break um, to our five mass seminar. It is a pleasure today to introduce da Daniel Apello, although he can pronounce it much nicer than I will. Um, so Daniel has a very impressive resume. He had he got his PhD from um, KTH in Sweden. He did a number of postdocs in impressive places, Caltech, um, one several more, and then he was an assistant professor at the University of New Mexico, an associate professor at UNM as well, and has recently moved to Colorado, to Boulder, where he is in the applied math department. And today he's going to tell us what's new with the lady question. Thank you. Thank you very much, and, and, and I would also like to extend a thank you for everyone's day. I guess you have spring break coming up, as, as we do, and uh, so yeah, I'm very grateful that you're all here and that I get to speak to you. Um, so yes, yeah, so what is new with the wave equation? Who knows? Uh, <laughs> many things, maybe. Um, so I want to begin with saying thank you to my collaborators. Um, main guy is uh, my, my long-term collaborator is Tom Hogstrom, who is at Southern Methodist University. On a lot of the stuff on Hermit methods, uh, Arturo Vargas, who is staff at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, uh, comes out of Tim Warburton's group, uh, <coughs> has been an important collaborator. Some of the stuff that I will talk about at the very end is done with uh, Ten Yang Li at RTI, um, and we'll see if we get, get to that point. So the outline here is uh, why high order, waves and polynomials, permit methods for wave equations, and then <coughs> towards the end I'll talk a little bit about this continuous converting methods. And we don't really have to get to the end. Hopefully we'll get to the second bullet. Uh, <laughs> but please ask questions throughout. Don't hesitate and it's not, you know, I, I will preach to you what, what I think is important. Uh, you can have different opinions or just clarifying questions. That's more than welcome. Um, so why high order accurate numerical methods for waves? Well, there's basically two <coughs> things that are important. And the first one that you might have heard about in your numerical analysis class, in my PD class, is that it's efficient to have uh, as few points per wavelength as possible for a given accuracy. And there's this relatively old paper by Heinz Kreis and Joe Oliver from the weather forecasting literature, uh, Pebbles from 1972, that has this classic um, rule of thumb um, formulas for how many points per wavelength you need to get 1% accuracy if you propagate J periods uh, combined. And if you just plug data in, if you want to propagate the wave with 1% error, that's a modest requirement, but you want to propagate it for 100 wavelengths, so pretty far away, and you want to do this in three dimensions plus the four dimension, fourth dimension space, then it turns out that you need 640 to the power of four points in your computation, so 0 0.2 trillion coin, points, um, not, not 0 0.2 trillion points, but 0 0.2 trillion samples of that function in space and time. That starts to be a little bit expensive. If you go to a higher order method, this gets reduced quite drastically. The other side of the coin is really that we are starting to hit the memory wall in terms of computations. So it's of course great that things grow exponentially in performance, and processors and the speed of processors have grown exponentially, as has the memory. But unfortunately, if two things grow at two different exponential rates, the gap also grows exponentially. So we might have been in a regime where we were basically CPU bound, over here, and where did I start my PhD, about here maybe. Um, but extrapolating this, we will be only limited by the memory bounds. So we need to somehow circumvent that, um, at least in some degree, and <clears throat> Down here is another depiction basically of the same picture. This is from a paper by Jesse Chan and Jim Warburton. This is called roof line analysis. And what you see here is the possible um, performance of a computer. And in this regime, it's limited by the bandwidth of the memory. 
and over here is the peak performance of the processor. And as you traverse their methods, this is a low order method, and it goes up to higher order methods. So you're really trying to traverse this curve up until you use a machine for it. So it's not just yes, sort of mathematical aspect, it's also hardware aspect. And unfortunately, uh, I have no influence over the electrical engineers, and they are not going to build. So they are not going to build faster memory. They just want to sell things based on faster processors. So we have to somehow mitigate. So what about weights and polynomials? Uh, anyone know who this guy is? That's right, handsome French character. Anyone knows who this guy is? Says you can almost guess by the by the. Kyrillic language. Say again? Yep, Chebyshev. So, we have weights that we want to simulate, or at least I want to simulate, and they are described by complex exponentials or sines or cosines. But often, we want to work with uh, numerical methods that rely on polynomials. And the typical polynomial uh, is a Chebyshev polynomial that you <coughs> might use in a, um, in a high order computation method. And if you just look at these, they kind of look the same, right? We have a couple of, in this case, I guess, five peaks and six at the bottom. <coughs> so this guy over here is kind of flipped. But they have the same number of oscillations. So um, it seems reasonable that we should be able to approximate the weight with this polynomial. I don't really care about approximating functions. I care about approximating derivatives to functions because I want to solve PDEs. So what is actually more important uh, to me is how do I approximate derivatives of functions, in particular in space. So <coughs> if I take a look at the derivatives of these two guys, then the derivative of <coughs> the Fourier mode is just going to be the same function times whatever the mode is, right? So in this case, it's 15 point something higher, so I guess this was maybe 3 pi, uh, 4 pi, I guess. <coughs> and the derivative of the Chebyshev character, he is about 15 in the middle, coinciding with the size of the weight, but towards the boundaries, it's much, much larger. So if I want to approximate uh, basically a derivative, it's going to scale like the order of the polynomial, or order of the Fourier mode, uh, if I use a Fourier basis. But for a Chebyshev discretization or for a polynomial discretization, it's going to scale as uh, the polynomial degree squared. But that only happens at the boundaries. So the key exploit that I'm going to do here is that I'm going to do whatever I can, by hook or by pro. I'm going to stay away from these boundaries and I'm going to do everything at the uh, So the trick here is going to be to evolve at the cell center, both for my DG methods and both for my Hermit methods. So I'm just going to give away the story. Uh, if you discretize with spectral elements or traditional discontinuous polarity methods, then the uh, time step constraints, so H is the space discretization, and I'm thinking of a wave propagation problem, so I have a color problem. Then you would have to take the time step compared to the uh, grid discretization step to be 1 over the degree of the method, roughly speaking. And this is if you match the time discretization with the space discretization. You typically have to do n communications per step. So let's say that you use a fourth of the Runger Kappa method. You have to do four communications because there's four stages. The Hermit methods that I will talk about, uh, we are always going to be able to take delta p to be the same as h, the modulus um, speed of sound, which I said to be one here. And we're going to do exactly one communication per time step. So we think that these are offsets. <laughs> Finite differences, you have the same <coughs> thing that you have to communicate a little bit more often, but they do have better um, time step constraints because they widen the stem step. Finite differences can be a little bit tricky to do near the boundaries in a stable way, uh, but otherwise they are pretty good methods. 
Okay, so what are these Hermite methods? Well, you might not recognize this guy, but that's Charles Hermite. Uh, he looks pretty uh, angry. <laughs> uh, so Hermite methods have absolutely nothing to do with Hermite orthogonal polynomials. So for those of you who like them, let's say in unbounded domains, um, forget about them. They are not Hermitian matrices, but in fact, they are arbitrary order, nodal-based methods for solving PDEs that use Hermite interpolation. So Hermite interpolation is the Hermite uh, invention that I, I, I will try to rely on. And let me bust some myths. So there's a popular myth that says that high degree interpolants of non-smooth functions must oscillate. Not true. <coughs> high order polynomial element methods must have derivative matrices scaling, scaling like the square of the degree of the uh, polynomial force in small time steps. That's what we saw in the first picture. You have these boundary layers. Also, not true. So let's just uh, own in a little bit more to, to be specific about the the notation of the Hermite interpolation. So most of you think about Hermite interpolation as something where you take the function values and a derivative. There's no reason to stop there. You can take two derivatives, three derivatives, four derivatives, 25 derivatives. Uh, and you can, in principle, interpolate with many points. I will only use two points. So I will take two points, one point, let's say, x1, and one point, x2, and I will create a polynomial so that its derivatives and the function values matches the derivatives and function values at those points. So I will create a degree 2m plus 1 polynomial out of degree n polynomials. In a higher degree, you do tensor product um, versions of this. Is that a big constraint on the method, the fact that you have to do tensor product? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's definitely a big constraint. I mean, in, in the sense that you, you have to work Current implementations are only done on tensor product grids. There are mathematical generalizations of Hermite interpolation processes to general poly polygonal domains. Um, I've only seen one paper, and I have never even tried to implement it. So I won't say that it's not possible, but I might not, not want to do it myself. I remember that there was a passion to try these methods for boundary element methods. So there is, the business of sticking all these things together is really complicated. Yes, I that was in my mind. Right. So of course, um, handling curvilinear bits is not a problem. Uh, but suppose you had triangles, right? So then I don't really know what is. Um, again, I won't say I like the methods. I'm not going to say that it won't be possible, but it might be less convenient. Um, and uh, just to upstage myself, the. <coughs> What we do is that we think of these methods as basically something that can be extremely efficient in the volume, and then near boundaries we have to switch to something else. Typically a, a discontinuous coverting method in, in my case. Okay, so here is uh, three kinds of interpolation, namely Lagrange interpolation on an equidistant grid uh, using some different number of points, you can see that that's not such a good idea. Suppose I want to solve a fluid dynamics problem, and this is, let's say, density. Then, unless you're on some severe diet, you don't want the density to go negative, because that's unphysical. Um, so that's maybe not such a great idea. Here is what happens if you discretize, or if you use Chebyshev grid distribution. You still have oscillation, so this is Ranier, that is Gibbs. On the other hand, if you take Hermite interpolation, you can you match the function values and all the derivatives, then it's actually a monotone <coughs> function. And if you write down the total variation of the original function and these, they are exactly the same. So it has interesting properties. So it turns out that Hermite methods can actually be made to uh, made into pretty reasonable conservation law solvers. So there is yes a snapshot of one example. So here I just solved a linear advection problem. So I just take the initial data and advect it through with just the transport equation. Here is a Hermite method of order 19. 
and I match the number of degrees of freedom to a Wiener method. Uh, so Wiener is this weighted essentially with normal Schmetter methods that are supposed to be very good for <coughs> difficult problems like this. Um, the difference here is that we really preserve the function quite well. We don't have so much dissipation. Wiener has a little bit of dissipation. And you can also do conservation loss, although I won't talk about that. We have done that. Uh, so we, we know how to do uh, nonlinear conservation loss. Here's another favorite example of mine. Uh, <coughs> so probably most of you have taught calculus. Uh, so, and maybe some of you have taught numerical analysis. So if you try to interpolate the absolute value function using equidistant Lagrangian tabulation, it converges exactly at three points. Here, here, and here. And everywhere else it diverges violently. Okay, so it's so I realized this, and then I, <coughs> I, I tried with Hermitian tabulation, and it, is, it works pretty well. And actually, if you write down what the Hermitian turbulent is, you recognize something from calculus, namely the expansion of the square root, well, of this function, which can be reduced to the square root with this uh, simple change of variables. So it's also proof that the Hermitian tabulation actually does convert to this case. Um, but it's, it's kind of interesting. It doesn't converge very fast, I admit. But, but at least it does converge. OK, fine. So it has these nice properties, but can we make it into a PD solver? So here, I will focus on the uh, wave equation. And I will focus on 1D, because I want you to sort of understand what is going on. Uh, we can generalize that to multiple dimensions quite easily. And I will also focus on a conservative formulation that is a little bit more recent uh, research of ours. Uh, you can also do dissipative methods and other conservation laws, but I, I won't really talk about that. We have done some small test examples where we solve elliptic problems, but we really haven't gotten started with that. Um, Tom has worked on OVE solvers uh, within this framework, but uh, so far I've not been involved. Okay, so here's the plan. I want to solve the linear wave equation, and I'm going to think of C as being a constant speed of sound. And I'm going to work on this grid. I'm going to assume that this is current time level, and this is previous time level, and I have two points here, and I have some previous data over here, some previous time level. And what am I going to do? I'm going to assume that I know polynomials, uh, one polynomial over here of degree n, another polynomial of degree n over here, and I know something uh, from a previous time level. Let me point out I just used the same C everywhere where here, but they are, in reality, they are different polynomials. But it's just, I was lazy updating the equation. And the goal is here to just leap from the data up to this point. You think we can do it? <clears throat> Don't be so negative. <laughs> I think we can. But how? Um, so, <clears throat> again, just let me point out that the degree of these polynomials are n. So what order of accuracy do you think we can get? Out of this method. Suppose you have you know, a finite difference stencil with n plus one points, what do you think the accuracy is that you can get that way? M ish, right? Yes. We'll get two M. We'll get two M. Because we are going to take the data over here and the data over here and form a new interpolant, namely the Hermite interpolant, that is of degree two M plus one. And we're going to center it here at the cell center because we we're planning to leap from data from here via this up to this point. Okay, so how do we do that? <laughs> what is the most important uh, technique in numerical analysis? What is the first thing that you learn in numerical analysis? Errors. Errors. Errors, errors. errors yes. Uh, and and what, what British mathematician is associated with errors? Yes, indeed. Favor. 
we're going through this, uh, you know, we have seen a French guy, uh, maybe more than one French guy, one Russian guy, and now a British guy. So Taylor is really pretty good, right? So you might remember that if you expand a function in time around plus minus delta t over 2, then you get the function at x and t plus delta t over 2 plus first derivative in time plus other junk, uh, which you can write on this more general form, including as many terms in the series as you please. Now, if we add these guys up, all the even terms remain and all the odd terms go away because of this plus minus here. So I added up the evolution, uh, the expansion around plus delta t over 2. That's what we want. And then I added that up together with the expansion at the previous time step. And then I get a long sum here, as long as I please. So that's all well and good, uh, but we also need to take into consideration what is the PD we need to solve. And we also have to think about, um, this is just an equation for the function, but in Hermitian interpolation, you really think about the derivatives as well. We have to get conditions for the derivatives, or a formula for the derivatives. So the first thing that we do is that we um, <coughs> differentiate the expression in x some number of times. Okay, this is just linear expression. You might can differentiate it, at least symbolically. Uh, so now I have another formula. It's exactly the same formula. It just has ddk with respect to x on it. It's fine, I think. Um, and what is the next step? <coughs> Do I know anything about the time derivatives of, of this Hermit polynomial that I have? The answer is no. But I know a lot about, I know I, I know the derivatives of the polynomial, the spatial derivatives. So somehow I have to trade space derivatives for um, time derivatives. And how do I do that? The wave equation. I know the wave equation. <laughs> we, have to, we have to use the equation, otherwise we're kind of uh, not being honest. So indeed, we trade all the, the even, <coughs> uh, even uh, time derivatives for space derivatives through against the wave equation. So rather than having this, we get a little c here from, the, from, from this guy. And rather than time and space derivatives, we just get uh, space derivatives. OK, so now I'm ready to use this formula. And I use the formula by taking my, my polynomials, and I insist that they approximate my function u. And I have a polynomial down here of degree m. I have two polynomials here that I forced into degree 2m plus 1. So it turns out that to update the m plus 1 degrees of freedom, the function and the m first derivatives, I need exactly the amount of data that I have here at the set center because I get this factor of 2. So I can just insist that the polynomials satisfies the above equation. And I can just note that I can relate the coefficients of these table polynomials to the derivatives of the, of, of, of the same polynomials with you know, scaling and some factorial. So it turns out that the update formula for each coefficient k at the next time level just depends on the same coefficient at the previous time level plus some uh, combination of the previous ones. So this is really the PDE, but in, in coefficient form. So it's quite compact update and quite fast. So let me ask, maybe stop there. So it, it, was that clear? Any questions at this point? I, I've thought about this many times, right? So I can follow myself, hopefully. But if there's any anything that you want to ask about here, then I, that's a good point. Is it what point is unclear? Okay, well, I'm happy to be in the room with full of smart people. <laughs> <laughs> so so, question, yes, of course. In terms of the memory complexity yep. at each grid point, the yep. is, uh, how does it scale? So, um, so in 1D, 
I would just store a global array of uh, m plus one coefficients at each data point. Suppose I am in 3D, I store one array of m plus one q because it's tensor product. And then the global consumption of memory is that I need to have um, one array here and one array on the next level. So to, to uh, advance the solution in time, I need two global arrays. That's it. Because the leapfrogging here is done on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. You see, I didn't incorporate anything from my nearby friends. So everything is, is optimal in, in terms of storage, I would say. Um, I only need to, to stage that. Compared to running Kata method, you would need, need at least four stage, global stage uh, pieces. I mean, you can get away with three if you play the game. Yeah, that's, it's pretty memory efficient, actually. OK, so let me just mention the ingredients of how to analyze this method. Um, so since we work with Hermit and Turbulence, main the main part of the analysis is done in this semi-inner product. So we take the n plus first derivative of the function and <clears throat> some other function, and that this, um, defines a, a semi-inner product. And that's where we do all the operations. That's where we do all the analysis. Because in that inner product, we have a orthogonality relation. So that the, for a given function, if we subtract the interpolant of that function, then that new function is orthogonal to any polynomial of degree at most 2n plus 1, and in particular against any interpolant. So this implies that we have a Pythagorean theorem, which says that the function that we started out with is the same as our interpolant plus the error. This is really a stability statement. So the process of Hermit interpolation is guaranteed the Hermit interpolant is guaranteed to be smaller in this norm than what we started up with. And why is it a stability statement? Because the way we leap from the data here is an exact evolution of the polynomial data. So the, the way the equation that we're not committing any, any error in time for the data that we start out with. So the only thing that comes in is just the stability of the interpolation process, that's really guaranteed by this form. Okay. Surprisingly, to me at least, even though the interpolation process is dissipative, it is also self-adjoint. <coughs> it's quite surprising, but, but you can show this on a couple of lines. So we actually use that in this, uh, in this version of the method because we show conservation. So the analysis of the method relies on studying the energy of the wave equation, which is just the L2 integral of the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. But we rewrite this. In one week, in one week we rewrite it like this. We, just, we, we note that if we um, carry out these this squares, we actually get back to this. But it turns out that this is really the natural thing to do, because this is the direction of the information in the system, so the characteristics. And in higher dimensions, you can do the same thing, but the solution operators are more complicated. You can't really write it, write it down quite easily. And then we work in these Dalembarian variables or characteristic variables. And after a couple of pages, um, we can find that the error at some final time is going to be on the order of h to the power of 2m, and then times 1 plus t to the 3. I don't think the 3 is real. I think that's yes because we're not good enough mathematicians. I think the 3 is a bond. Uh, but we couldn't get it. And um, this is true for all time steps that are um, Restricted by the, the, the standard shape of function. Okay, so, so just a flavor of how you would analyze it. So let me just show due diligence. Um, and first of all, I should say 
these numbers are not correct, they should be offset by 1. So n equals to 1 should be 0, 2 should be 1, and so forth. And here I'm just solving a wave equation in a box, 2D standing wave equation. And you can <coughs> see that um, the rates of convergence, if I have a zero order, if I just have constants, uh, then it's zero order accurate. You know, 2m two, two, two when m is equal to zero is zero. So h to the zero is just constant error. Then if I have linears, it's second order accurate. Um, quadratics, it's fourth order accurate, sixth order accurate, and so forth. <laughs> However, if I run at exactly CFL condition one, and this was kind of surprising to me, I can take two constants, I can, take two, I can design a method that takes two constant values, and I have a second derivative in the method. So I could, should make sense that I can only create a linear, and linear should be killed by second derivatives. But it just so happens that you get cancellation of errors. So you get actually a second order method when you run exactly at CFL condition one. So this is a little bit different than uh, what you see in finite differences in 1D, because there you get perfect, you get no error because you track the characteristics. Here, if you do a careful analysis of the local plantation error, a little term comes up which has the CFL condition, minus one, and it so happens that independent of the, the number of dimensions, that guy vanishes when you run at CFL exactly one. Does that still hold for non-constant velocities? Uh, probably not, probably not. Uh, because I think that, um, not identically, I'm, I would be hard to think that that's true. But it is in general true that running at the higher CFL condition as close to one will give better error constants. That's, that's definitely true. Nevertheless, I mean, I think it's good method. Right? Of course, I think it's good method. <laughs> I have my picture color on. Um, it's pretty reasonable. You have a method that takes, you know, in this case, let's say six degrees of freedom, and you get um, a tenth order method. It's pretty good. And if I compare to my DD implementations, so these are same problem, 2D as standing weight. Here I run an eighth order discontinuous scalarity method. Um, and I've been honest, I've you know, tried to optimize it by own code. And I compare to my Hamid methods, um, the dissipative methods and the conservative methods. So the conservative methods is what I talked about. And the order of all these methods are, this is eighth order, this actually is ninth order, this is an eighth order method. But um, if I look at you know, whatever error I look at, the conservative Hamid method is actually quite a bit better than the in terms of getting the solution for a fixed CPU time, a couple of orders of magnitude. So we also implement these guys on GPUs, and we use um, the open concurrent computing architecture or environment. Um, so this is Tim Warburton's own language. Um, here I, I'll, I'll just present some results for a sixth order accurate method, conservative. So we run 140 points cubed on a single um, Tesla card, no, Pascal card. Uh, and since we have a sixth order method, that means that m is equal to 3, and we have a 0, right, 4 <coughs> degrees of freedom. It turns out this is 0. 0.2 billion degrees of freedom. So if I run this on a <coughs> A Broadwell Intel um, 2 times 18 core Intel uh, processor, and I compare to the latest NVIDIA Pascal P100, then um, the time it takes to update a single degree of freedom is 6.4 nanoseconds for the GPU, and on the GPU I spend 0.33 nanoseconds. So it's actually um, a speed up or time to solution that is about a factor of 20. And that's actually pretty good. Um, of course, the GPU is a little bit more expensive, but it's not 20 times more expensive. And if I look at uh, other very good implementations of, of DD methods, also on accelerators, they are uh, a little bit slower than what we 
Okay, so um, maybe some comments. So the, the conservative methods, we base on velocity and displacement. So we introduce the velocity, which is the time derivative of this displacement. Um, so we also have those. We have theory for them as well. The conservative methods are slightly faster, but I think they are kind of limited to Cartesian grids uh, because the structure here, when you do the leapfrogging, I think that might be sensitive. Um, I'm not convinced, but I think it might be sensitive if you do non-Cartesian grids. So they are really the Ferrari method, but you don't want to drive in the woods with them. So I think the discipline methods don't the discipline methods don't have that problem. Do you think orthogonal meshes would also be okay? That would probably be possible. That I think I'm convinced that would be possible. But if you go off off an orthogonal, then you might have. Um, yeah, so this the methods are more flexible. I think this is just a, this is a scalar wave equation. I guess randomly put material properties, um, speed of sound, and so this is with the dissipative method and of course this one. But the, so, okay, so what's the drawback? No free match. <laughs> The drawback is that it, it is hard to handle boundary conditions on curved geometries. Because at the flat boundary, we can use imaging principles, and actually, you know, we know a lot about how the solution actually will look like. But for a curved boundary, although we could use imaging principles, we would have to know a lot about the curvature and higher order curvature. And I don't think it's really practical, even if it was in theory possible. So in order to get uh, geometric flexibility. I want to hybridize this with discontinuous scalar principles. And I want to talk about the hybridization. I will just talk about the detail. How many of you have uh, implemented discontinuous scalar principles? Okay, good, good. <laughs> That's great. That's your job. Huh? That's your job. Yes, that, that is indeed my job. So, so the before I go to this part of the talk, any other questions on Harmi? So the, the, the problem you did for the two-dimensional wave equations that were in the box. Yeah, that was in the box. What did you do about the boundaries? So, uh, so at the boundary, so at, at the flat boundary, I know, let's say that I know that the solution is, let's say that it's just a homogeneous Dirichlet boundary condition. I just know that the polynomial that I interpolate has to be all. Okay. And if it's a, and so forth. Yeah. So that's why I say that flat boundaries, no problems. Yeah. But if I have all the curvature, a student will implement the form. <laughs> no, I wouldn't do that. Just I had a question on the self determinants. Yes. So that's a really nice implementation, implementation point of view. Yep. So I'm wondering, two part question. First, does that hold for variable coefficients? It remains self adjoint? So um, if it would hold, if, the, um, if you say that the coefficients are constant on each node. So I think you can let them be uh, whatever they want at each given node, but they have to be, they cannot have a, let's say, a polynomial representation on that node. So point-wise constant velocities, then I think it would. But if, and it doesn't hold for the dissipative method. Okay, and the second part is, if you had a more exotic way of equation, that was a linear combination of uh, second order partial differential and partial differential. Does it still hold that it's self? Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. Um, it, it depends. If the, if the equation is self adjoint in itself, then I believe that you could make it self adjoint. We're just using the properties of the equation to change the trade space derivatives with time derivatives. So if that's. If that is done in a self-adjoint or reversible fashion, then I try to do that. But on the other hand, if you want, let's say, attenuation in the model, I hope that's all. Right? Okay, good. So since you, <coughs> you gave yourself away, I get to give my three-slide introduction of discontinuous calerpin, and then you will be experts. Um, it's really quite a simple method. The first step is to control the energy in the continuous problem. And the second step is to find the DD method. And that has some sub-steps. The first sub-step is to multiply by test function. 
second step is to add zero. That's what mathematicians do. Um, and then the third step is to improve or to guarantee stability. We use the solution as the test function. This is the Gerberkin trick. And then we try to get an energy estimate. And actually, this zero won't be quite zero because it will have some numerical flux in it. And the trick then is to use the, this bullet to choose that flux, numerical flux, so that we get stability. Simple recipe. OK, we start with a continuous problem. Now, think about my favorite equation, transport equation. Um, the duty plus dx is equal to 0 on just a single element, x not to x1, could be the full domain. So I start by multiplying the equation by the solution. And then I split this term into two parts. And I integrate one of those by parts. I take up a minus sign, which kills the other guy, but I get boundary terms. So if I put the boundary terms on the right hand side of the equation, I have one half PDT of the L2 norm of the function equals boundary contributions. In this case, I see that I don't have to do anything with the <coughs> boundary contribution to the right. But if I want a well-posed problem, I have to specify boundary condition on the left. So that's basically how I control the energy in the, in the um, continuous system. And all you have to do is integrate by parts. That's, and I'm sure everyone in this room knows how to do that. OK, so now dv on a single element. I'm going to approximate the solution u by putting an h on it. And I'm going to approximate it by some time-dependent coefficients time of basis function, or time basis functions, which in this case I would just choose to be monomials. To get the to get the method, I take my equation, multiply by test function, integrate. Integrate on an element. And then you can think of this as either integrating by parts twice, or you can just say, I'm going to add zero here, just because I want to. <coughs> So we haven't done anything here. And here is how you do a DV method. You rename one of those contributions by putting a star on it, and you call it numerical flux. So it doesn't seem very hard, right? And in fact, it's not very hard. So at this point, we have a formula that only lives on one element. And as you might remember, when we look at hyperbolic problems, information travels, right? So we have to have some ability to communicate with other elements. And that communication comes in exactly here. So we are going to choose this guy uh, in some way that relates the information at two sides of an interface. OK. So first, we use the Galerkin trick. We replace the solution, the test function by the solution. And then we take a look at two element contributions, one to the left and one to the right. And then I'm not going to care about the right hand, left hand side of these equations. I'm only going to focus on <coughs> this part. And in addition, I'm only going to focus on the top part of this evaluation, because that's what is at this interface. And over here, I'm just going to focus on the bottom part, because that's what is at that interface. And if I write out those terms, it turns out that it's exactly this. So u to the left squared minus u to the right squared plus 2u minus <coughs> times u to the right minus u to the left. OK, let me hold it up. What, what should I put in instead of u star? <laughs> what does it look like kind of um, what comes to mind completing the square, right? Well, OK, I put in the, the plus sign here, and I cancel the 2 because I have 1 half. Um, and if you do that, then <coughs> this whole thing inside here exactly vanishes. Right? So you don't get any energy contribution at the interface. So this is kind of the you know, Eastern European choice, average. Um, and if you want uh, a choice that actually creates dissipation, then you can do upwinding. So you can just choose the flux from the direction where the information is traveling from uh, and use that on both sides. Pretty easy, right? That's a DD method. It's not too complicated. OK. So now I'm going to repeat this for my favorite equation, 
uh, the, the wave equation. And in the wave equation, the energy is this, so the, or the time derivative of the energy is this. So it's the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. And you know, I'm going to blindly follow the recipe. I'm going to multiply by a test function. I'm going to add zero. I'm going to use the solution as a test function to get an energy estimate. And then I choose the integral parts. And <clears throat> OK, so I start. So I have two equations here. I like to write it as uh, velocity displacement form. So what was the first step again? Yes, multiply by a test function uh, and uh, integrate. OK, so I'm going to do that. I'm not going to care what is on the right-hand side, because this is going to not work. <coughs> OK, so then I repeat the recipe here. I choose the test functions as the solutions. And I integrate the uxx uh, term by the arcs. And I add the two equations together. This comes out. So this kind of looks like a good term. It's a time derivative of a quadratic term. This is a time derivative of a quadratic term. This, however, and this, however, is problematic. Because in the continuous setting, b is the same as u t. But we are in discrete world now. So b is not the same as the time derivative of u. So this is not a quadratic term anymore. There's no way for us to control it. So Russian guy number two, Kalerkin, is very curious what to do about this. So what do you think we should do? Well, we make him turn over in his grip. So we commit heresy by multiplying, not with the test function, but with the negative Laplacian of the test function. <laughs> and of course, he doesn't like. That's okay. I don't. He's dead, so he can't do too much. Can you already? Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I'm going to do this, and now I also added zeros on the right hand side. So I added a zero, you know, b star minus u t, and w here is the normal derivative of the of the displacement. Um, so now, if if I do the the Galarkin trick, I replace the test function with the solution <coughs> and add up the equations, then this actually happens. This, this comes out, so I, I replace and add them up. Now, I have this <coughs> complicated um, cross term, which exactly cancels with this, because I cooked it up in such a way that it would. So, at the end of the day, we get exactly the energy that we would like to conserve in the continuous problem, modulo some flux contributions on the right hand side. Those we can choose either in the uh, average way or in an upwinding way. Um, I think I probably have that on the next slide. So it turns out that if you choose the velocity as a weighted average between one element and another element, and you choose the normal derivative sort of in the opposite direction of the average. And then you can choose uh, to add negative the jump in u at an interface. This is supposed to be very small, order of the method, uh, and negative the jump in v. Then the contribution at one element interface, or an interface between two elements, is exactly this. You can design a conservative method by simply choosing tau and beta to be 0. If you like dissipation, we give you that opportunity too. It's a free coming. Um, so pretty easy trick. But OK, minus Laplace, how did we come up with that? Well, a general wave equation typically consists of kinetic energy and some potential energy density. So now, if we think about how uh, these equations, taking all the wave equations, are derived, we take the Lagrangian and we do a variation of calculus on that. So what we end up testing with is the variational derivative of the potential energy density. So that is the general form that we test with. And it happens to be negative Laplace in that, in that particular case. But the formula is much more general. So as long as we have, as long as you give me an energy, a potential energy density, I shall generate for you a discontinuous converting method that is guaranteed to be stable. Although I admit it looks very messy. <coughs> okay, so some comments. 
you might have noticed that the first equation kind of takes this form. I have integrated by partial at once. So what is the problem with this equation? What are my test functions? What is the first test function on an element? What is the first monomial or the CRF monomial? A constant. What happens if I plug in a constant? Equation dies. So is that a problem? Well, it depends on, I don't think so. So um, it's actually the natural consequence of the wave equation. The wave equation energy is invariant in constants. So the energy has a null space. So I need to pin that null space down. And I do it in a formal way by taking null vectors of the energy density and taking moments of that okay, uh, of this equation against that. So in this case, you know, there's a one multi-time both of these. So there's a formalism to how to actually handle it. Um, what can we prove? We can prove various things. Um, the error estimates depend on the flux. Um, for an unstructured grid, we can, you know, prove optimal. Um, we can prove suboptimal fluxes by order one for conservative fluxes, and by order one half for dissipative fluxes. We see optimal convergence for dissipative fluxes, but we can't prove it. In one D, we can uh, do some proofs for some fluxes that are optimal, uh, but it's technical, it's not easy to generalize to multiple dimensions. Because you have to construct another projection which you compare the DD solution to, and that construction is kind of particular to rect rectilinear grids, and then you compare uh, the error with that approximation, and then there's another term where you compare the, the true solution against that projection. It's technical. Okay, so let me just show one example here um, where we solve this for the elastic wave equation. So here I'm looking at the problem just on a flat boundary where we have radius surface waves. So I'm just prescribing the radius surface wave, which is a free surface wave. And it has uh, exponential decay as you go down in, into the curve. And what matters for the properties of that wave is the ratio between the compression speed and the shear speed. And that is here dictated by this value of mu, which is one of the MA parameters. And I'm comparing here to a finite difference method. In finite difference methods, it turns out that if you change this uh, MA parameter to make the material more and more incompressible, then it gets to be harder and harder. And it is true that it also gets harder and harder for our methods, but the difficulty um, is associated with a higher order error term in the equation. So typically, it doesn't even show up. Um, so we think that there's some merit to, to, to using these kinds of methods. OK, so um, we can do other problems. You know, the lamps problem, which is a point source that sits on top of the surface, and you poke it, and we do get orders of convergence that are um, high, consistent with the method. Uh, we can handle other geometries with these methods and you know, have stable, basically more conservative. But the sad news is that we can't get around this uh, painful time step constraint. So these boundary layers also exist for us. So we have just worked with element-based methods so far. So we are restricted to take the time step scale at least as one over the order of the method. If we use a fixed order time discretization, this is worse, it's one over the order squared. This assumes that we use the same order in time and space. So what can we do about this? Well, we go back to the picture, and we think. And what do you think the trick is? Okay, it's a little bit tricky, right? We're going to compute integrals of things over the whole domain. How can we do this? Well, what we're going to do is that we're going <coughs> to be lucky. It turns out that exactly in our formulation, the 
thing that updates the time derivative with the velocity has in the right hand side the flux only of the displacement and vice versa. The time derivative of the displacement has the flux <coughs> of the velocity. So without actually doubling any variables, we just stagger the grids and then we get the flux for the yellow <coughs> element exactly where it's as best behaved as it can be. And the same is true over here and vice versa. So we just stagger the finite elements. And what is the result? The result is that the ratio of um, the eigenvalues times this is a constant. So we, we can, we, the effect of this is that we can run at, CFL, at a constant CFL condition for any order of the method. Unfortunately, we can't do this slightly easily on the boundaries. So we will have a, one cell at the boundary, which we have to treat implicitly. So we do, typically we do spectral deferred correction methods that are explicit everywhere in the interior, but on one cell we have to invert the loop system. Actually on two cells in this case. And what is this? This is just a description of some pretty difficult 1D problem, so we just propagate weight, and as the order goes up, here it's 29, 31, 33, you see the error goes down spectrum. So that's a pretty cute little thing. And we have done this in 2D as well, on periodic meshes, um, but I haven't had time yet to implement it on, on meshes where, um, where I actually do the boundary terms explicitly. So in this particular instance here, we have a pretty highly oscillatory wave. I use eight times eight elements to discretize this uh, with 16 degrees polynomials, and I keep it on five digits of accuracy. And I use a CFL condition that is 0 0.3, even though I use 16 degrees. So just to conclude, I've hopefully convinced you that Hermit methods might have some interest, uh, and that by making the lurking angry, you can actually come up with some cute methods. Um, and we are, of course, trying to exploit these methods for <coughs> various engineering pro problems, but we're, um, we will be happy to collaborate with anyone who's interested in, in doing that because we have um, no real credibility in that area, I would say. And with that, I'd say